I'd love to tell you that I spent my afternoon binging uh, AUSA, but I did not. <laughs> yeah, best of luck with that. Um, I think you can <laughs> find the opening credit sequence sometimes. Have you seen right. that? Yeah. I have seen that, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I think, all that's left. There was a brief period of time <laughs> where it was on... Um, someone uploaded all the episodes. I have no idea who did it, but they were just sitting there for a while. Um, and then I guess, you know, 20th swooped in. Uh, yeah. And, and took care of that. Um, uh, they, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> nope. Nope. Not a sign. Nuh uh. Nope. Uh, yeah. Here it comes. I shall admit him now. PJ! Sean! <laughs> well, sorry, I was updating my, who knew I had to update my Zoom. I understand completely. I had to do the same. Okay. <laughs> Wait, how now, John? Hold on. Let me, hold, sorry to interrupt, but sure. uh, you've got this nice sort of fuzzy background, John. Yeah. I've been, I've been, uh, I've been, I'm, I don't want to say expert, but I've been zooming a lot, you know, and uh, <laughs> there's uh, some options you have in, um, what is it? Uh, next to stop, think. next to stop video. There's a little arrow that points up. You hit on that. That gives you a couple options. Like fish and I could be in Disneyland right now. You could be in Disneyland right now if you want. I could be in San Francisco. Oh, if you could oh. like, you could be a photo that I actually took myself of the Bitmore, Biltmore Hotel in downtown L.A. <laughs> Ooh. Here's a little Brooklyn in the 70s for you, but we'll just go back to Blur. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I've got, like, mine's, like, looks mine's a nursery. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Is that better? You look fine. You look fine. Oh, yeah, here's look the great. thing about you, PJ, is yes, that yes, you are. Here's the thing that, that strikes me about you. Uh, we're up and rolling right here, right? Oh, 100%. Always. We've been recording since well before I got up. Go on. <laughs> You've got that thing where, and let me finish because you're going to get upset at first. But No, no. I finish. think we all understand what you mean right now. You don't even need to finish. I've got that thing. You had that thing where you were losing your hair in your 20s and you looked a certain age at 28 and have stayed that age for the pre for the ensuing 35 years. <laughs> Yes, you look exactly the way you. I'm aging like an apple core. You look exactly the way you first did when all, we worked together 20 years all, ago. First of all, your face looks not a day old. You have this fabulous. I don't even know. I think you're like 22, but even with that, you have this like fabulous, whatever you are, and the glass is fuzzy too, which is weird. You have this like fabulous, sort of whitish, wispy, you know, thing. I don't remember having this little hair at 28. I was, you're right, I was about to be insulted, but, the, but you made up for it saying that in the ensuing, what would it be if I was 28? The ensuing 40 years, I've mentioned, hold on, but you know what? It's actually old. gotten pretty you bad. You are not and 68 I years old. Do they teach math at Juilliard? Because they, you are not 68. <laughs> math at Juilliard. I don't even have a response to that. However, on my balding pate, just today, I discovered something that I don't think is, is okay. And I called a dermatologist yeah. and made an appointment. Good. So let's talk Good. about that. Take care of yourself, man. Yeah, I'll gotta go on mole patrol. <laughs> mole patrol. I don't know. I don't know what like you know squeamish cells or you know or I don't know. Anyway, it's very good to see you both, John. I know you more. It's been a long time. This is oh my, my god plastic introduction. Hi, hello everybody. I don't know how it's supposed to go. <laughs> Oh man, it's so good to see you, Peter. So I, I'm gonna. Um, I have no idea if you have questions planned. Will I don't care. I'm gonna shoulder on ahead here. Um, Please do. So, so I it was met... like this always with John. It was like, and no matter what you had to say, John was like, "Okay, I'm gonna take control of the conversation." It's and and I'm and it's fine. It's great. But but I'm used that. to li I'm used to listening to his podcast anyway. So this is normal. I, I didn't I even know you had a podcast. It. I got. I listen. just my my pot. We are in between networks right now. Once I find a new home, you are you are very early on my list, Peter. But oh. let me let me take a, a moment here. So I meet Peter when we were testing for the um, oft-neglected NBC sitcom AUSA, um, which stands for Assisted United States Attorneys, which I don't have to tell you. <laughs> I, and, I got this interject. Can I, am I allowed to interject? Yeah, I, now that we're here, I actually, 
I thought you were my, I remember you, I thought you were my understudy on house and that was all the, or my stand in. And that's like why we were doing this. Frick. And I'm, now <laughs> I'm totally monster. remember. That. And you, you absolute really thought you were my garbage stand-in. human being. And I was like, well, Will, that's sort of weird that you're invited. Like, I mean. <laughs> that you invite someone who mostly does stand in and background. No, I thought no, it was I weird. We had a no. great relationship well, on house. And then no. I suddenly, it's like, oh yes, AUSA. Right. Now on house, you were the Indian guy who killed himself, right? You can't say that. I I was. I'm so you glad we're recording. That. You can say that. Um, <laughs> um, I meant the, the killing yourself part. Go ahead. The, so, uh, right, so, by the way, that's fine. so. I, but honest to God, and I, I honestly, I, I do absolutely fuck with Peter constantly. But I, I fuck with Peter out of my own insecurities because when yeah. I met him, we were testing for this pilot. But I knew his work. I had seen him off Broadway in the Reduced Shakespeare Company presents the the complete works of William Shakespeare uh, oh, abridged. Really? Um, with, um, uh, oh God, who's the other guy? He's married to Hope Davis. Um, Come on. John, John Patrick Walker. John Patrick Walker. One and, from there who has played the king in the traveling tour of Hamilton. Um, oh, is he really? Yes. Oh, good for him. Good Absolutely. for him. That's a great gig. Oh my oh, God. Good He's for good. him. The man can sing. I had no idea. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and I don't remember who the other guy was. Chris Duva. Show. Christopher Duva, who was a wonderful actor, uh, he had been recently uh, been expelled from, or I think graduated from NYU, uh, graduate acting program, and uh, that was that was the mid, the early to mid nineties. That's correct. Yeah, I would have gone. I went with my mom. It was right in the neighbor. It was in the neighborhood where I grew up. It was right there in Hell's Kitchen. I was either just out of college or on a break from college, and you blew me away. I was like, this guy is so fun to watch. I will, and you just you caught the eye, and then when you showed up. For the test thing, I had no chill yet. I, I I was in, I'd been in LA for like maybe six weeks. I got really lucky really fast with that gig. And I I I just blurted out like, oh my God, I saw you. And I just had absolutely no, like hold my card, show to my chest. None of that was there now. I'm infinitely more reserved and jaded now. Yeah, a bit. But um, it, it made me, know. I remember the test. It made me, it threw me off my game. I was like, you up. I'm sorry. This, little this, is what I wanna, this, this little is... ass kisser. And then I, I thought you were going up to the same part and you were totally bullshitting me to try to put, get, put me off kilt. Like, oh, I love you so much. I saw you in the Ritu Shakespeare. Ha, 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 ha. I'm going to get this part right from under you. But no, so I was different. That's why Scott Foley got the lead. That's right. Well, I was doing the same thing as Scott. That's what was weird. I was like, Scott, I loved you, man. I saw you in Felicity, and you were so fucking awesome. And I loved you were you. not. You were and absolutely he, not doing that. <laughs> if, you, if you've seen frame one of Felicity, I will eat my shoe. <laughs> I made out with Kerr Smith in an independent film before I did a complete works on Shakespeare. So you did tell me that. It. So Kerr Smith was on Felicity, and that was your actually that was what you were talking about with with Scott. You were you were you were playing the who do we know card, and Scott, who by the way already had the gig, was a producer on the show, yeah, was just sitting like, there because he was reading with a couple people. Right. Um, but it was it was um, either way, it didn't matter because you got the gig and I got the gig, and the rest is trivia. Sure. And we <laughs> <laughs> one thing about getting that gig was. It turned out I discovered later, Rich Appel, who was the creator of the gig, was a Chicago kid like me. And I just, I didn't, I knew nothing about him. I went in and it turned out we did two different versions of the pilot. We did, the first one was a uh, live audience, multicam. And then they said, fuck that. No, no. other way around. No, 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 we did a single camera because Malcolm in the middle was like, oh, everybody do single camera. So we did a single camera and they were like, this is good, but Bowie's kind of bringing it down. So let's see if we do a multicam, if John can ride syndication. He did. So we did the multicam version. It was on that second doing of the pilot that I realized, John, Rich and I discovered that Rich had worked for my father Back when I was in high school, who was a who was a reputable sports broadcaster? Not, Chicago, I right? wish. I wish he was, he was an anchorman. Uh, uh, not sports. I only wish he was sports. I know I was. Uh, he was yes. He was an anchorman in Chicago, and he was a, uh, a commentator. And he had this like his his sort of crack investigative team. And Rich was that. Like when he got out of Harvard, and 
And it wasn't delayed or he was like, look, he was like, wait a minute, are you Walter Jacobson's son? And I, I was think like, I was yeah. literally at dinner with you guys <laughs> on the lot when that well, happened. But, but talk about switching the thing. Like with you and I, I always knew you were way beneath me. There was never any sort of switching. I knew you were a little tyke and an ass kisser and I was never going to be intimidated by you. But with, with, Rich, with Rich, I was like, oh my God, you're the guy. Thank you. Thank you. And then when he realized that, Suddenly, it was like the dynamics shifted in a bit, and I had like about eight hours of being a little bit cooler than you. <laughs> you had high, you had kind of higher status for a moment. A little there. bit. It got, I lasted it, yay, you know, just so long until it, like it got like like an hour into the taping, and then everything was that, dead. That was right? about it. Anyway, we, that was interesting though because we and I swear to God, we were not going to spend the whole time on uh, on a dad? show that yes, absolutely no one for, remembers, but. Um, what was interesting is that, as Peter mentioned, we did do uh, a single cam version that was sort of the log line that you saw in the trades was like, oh, it's scrubs with lawyers. So right. if, remember that? So that yes. was like, so, and, you know, Scott, right. you know, and you know, Scott's an appealing lead and we've great timing, terrific straight man. But Zucker, who was running NBC at the time, just did not get single cam he just didn't have the he just is a guy who needs to be told when to laugh and he uh so he insisted they fired two actors bullets whizzed past our heads peter and i because we're like we're like fifth and, we're fifth and sixth on the call sheet and and I, I i don't know about peter's you know peter was a little more established at the time i was like i just borrowed time i don't know who knows we'll see how this goes <laughs> I, I i just paid off my student loans so when, it's a win-win ultimately but um and then they they brought in two new actors we we reshot the pilot we got picked up they fired yet another actor um replaced her with anna ortiz i remember that, still yeah. in touch and um, it was a bloodbath. It was just an absolute blood. And then the whole thing lasted for eight weeks. Right. It well, was, there was really... a little period before it became a, like a ratings bloodbath. And then that was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, the ratings bloodbath that we had was like 12 million viewers, which it, right now would get you six seasons in a movie. Please. But it's... it was, it was, it, the, it was, it's all really interesting. Cause I actually, I, I, when I was working on uh, the book that I'm, I'm uh, wedging into the conversation right now, um, <laughs> when I was, when I was working on the book, I actually went back through the trades online and found out what our numbers were for the premiere and like wow. we seriously because we can't we followed Frasier we fucking it, followed oh Frasier <laughs> but we were up against season two of American Idol the oh, that um, was smart that the, was Ru smart. the Ruben and Clay juggernaut when that show was like it was unstoppable there was just nothing you could do I remember you particularly were a huge American Idol fan if I recall I was very torn I was very, very. I remember tired. learning about the show from you and talking about American Idol, <laughs> and it was like, "What the hell is American Idol?" Because I was a New York actor. I was no, of course, no, because you were because you had trod the boards so much. Right. But, you know, but in all practicality, you said something really interesting that I remember. I know. I, you, go ahead. I because I was sitting at the hem of your garment for so much of those shoots. But you <laughs> said when we switched from single cam to multi cam with an audience and everything, you said there's going to be, a, and I don't. You may have been warning me or you were just thinking out loud i'll accept it either way you were like there's going to be a, a temptation to want to go bigger in front of the audience and i think that's a trap and i was like fuck that's wise that, that is look, wise interesting you point that out because it was after some maybe the second episode that rich pulled me aside and said i loved your dad but um you <laughs> you need to you need to fucking pull it back and, You're uh, kidding me! He did, totally. He was like, the whole thing is just, it's a little bit up here. And I said, well, why don't you give me better words to say? And then I'll, no, I did not say that. Rich was wonderful. <laughs> it was all, uh, he, and I was like, oh shit, I got to pull it back. Um, and then I guess I pulled it back long enough for us to be canceled after like they aired the fifth episode. Well, I it's was interesting. Most, it's most, not my responsibility. Mo most human beings are like 98% uh, water. Um, uh, for Peter, it's 98% insecurity and then 2% water. And I've, I've known this. So in, in the ensuing 20 years, have, have you been working? Um, he said drinking. Um, I have been, yeah, I'm, I'm keeping busy. I'm not now. And, you know, it's uh, this whole, you know, audition on your own thing. That's where the old school folks really get now. I, I, you know, I, I don't know anybody who's adjusting to it really well, but the the older guard of which, you know, like it or not, Peter, I am now in, um, it is, uh, 
it's really disorienting. What have you been, what are your tricks to self-taping? What are your, do you have any? Um, I just think this is going to be, well, whatever it is, it's trying not to make this look any bigger than it already is. And like the fishbowl thing, I, I went out and got like a, a camera. With like oh, speaking meat. speaking of which, could you take the fish eye lens off of your camera tonight? <laughs> could you do that? Would that be all right? That's about you know you hit me in a really soft neurotic spot. I know I'm nine. That's ninety eight percent. Ninety eight percent of you. What yeah. am I going to do? But How you're am I such a good shot, John. You would you know you think you'd get the two. By the way, listen, I can joke all I want, but yes, really can. take a fucking look at this thing. Oh please, if you, if you yeah, will. You know, we can anybody can have the nose, but you've got to fill the nose with that ninety eight percent that you're talking about. So your nose is negated. Plus it isn't even straight because I. I caught a volleyball to the face, as you'll see from this erratic shadow right here in high wow. school. And uh, so, I mean, there's this is significant. Who's By the way, they made my character Jewish I remember on that. AUSA. I remember that. And they tried to make my not, but everybody went, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, John, why are we playing volleyball? That's, I mean, we can get back to this other stuff. And Will, I'm sorry. I feel like we should be asking how you're doing. Can I just say that anytime I don't have to answer or actually ask questions, it's a good episode. So. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, uh, uh, volleyball was um, an elective uh, with a cute girl in it in my senior year. So it all came Oh, I thought it happened recently. You're talking about oh, God, no, 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 no. I've had this oh. for years. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, exercise. So, what was, so then what was it? It's, it's like you broke it or, or what? I guess I broke it. Yeah, it, 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 it was straight. And then you look at uh, it was straight in my senior photo. And then you look at a photo taken freshman year of college. And it's like, burp, burp. Um, so, yeah, it's, so it's all right. It's bad, a little bit of character. A, oh, I see it happen in between there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Let's keep talking about noses. Yeah. You know what's you know what's great about Peter too is that he has worked with more internationally esteemed rappers than any classically trained actor I know. Oh, it is I true, right? Got baked with no with result with method. I, got, I, method. Got I knew that. I asked him about that. Method and Man, rolls. Method yes. Red, the premiere episode of uh, Method and Red. Yeah. Um, we they, we had they had a party at their pad and um, yeah I was with Chris you know my friend Chris Hogan you know Chris Hogan you I know, know Chris, Chris yeah. Yeah, yeah Chris and I were there and um, I don't know why I'm implicating him in the story um, but uh, I don't I think I I'm gonna I'm gonna imitate just how long of a hit I took off of Method Man's joint that he handed me all right okay that's it I just did it that was that was the duration <laughs> I was baked. So I was so fucking plotzed. I couldn't, I mean, I, maybe this much smoke got into my body. I was gone. Um, and it was pretty thrilling because I was, you know, I would eventually I got over my paranoia and it was like, I was all soft in the joints and it was great. And, but yeah, he, he had good stuff. Let me just say. I'm shocked. I am. So and he red man, hold on. One other thing, red man in his golf cart that he drove from set, to whatever but no i take that back it was his car his actual car he's a dro driving had a tv on the uh, steering wheel i had never now i guess people have you know on dashboards you can but this was a television he was watching you know tv and movies while driving on the thing. mcneil lara yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a that's a timely <laughs> reference bowie nice sure. stuff <laughs> the kids um, will love it though don't worry about it and how are you john Good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm in a. I'm in a. I'm also in a a, a wee bit of a of a lull. I had a I had a self tape this morning, and I'm I'm not going to Kinahara it. Kind of a little Yiddish to move Very in. Very good. Thank yeah, you. yeah. But I um uh, you know what I've been doing if I can if I can manage it. Uh, my my wife Jamie puts me on tape a lot, and that's good, mm -hmm. and that's handy, and she gives good notes, and she's an actor herself, and, and it really does help. But sometimes it's nice to like go to one of those places in Hollywood that that does self tapes just because it forces you to pull your shit together, get dressed, put some shoes on, get in your car, go are to they a place. Are they, so they're open and happening because in New York they've been open for a few months. They're masked, but they've been open for a few months. You go in, you take your mask off for your audition, you put it back on, and they give you a really high quality, well lit, properly mic'd tape that you can then send in. And the the ritual of getting off your ass and going somewhere to audition, yeah, it, I like it. I like it. It helps I, a little bit. It gets me out of my head a little bit. I tend to 
usually wear a, a shirt and a tie for auditions because those are the kinds of roles I play when I'm not going sure. out for a romantic surfer cowboy roles. Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm used to wearing like a shirt and a tie coat and basically panties. I mean, it's, you know, and then I forget when it's like, oh, it's time for the slate. And then I have to go and put my pants on. And But yes, that's exactly the point. Is it, it that just what that says and how that feels, there is something relaxed about it and at home, but maybe that cuts against the energy that really needs to be there. I mean, I was just whining about this last night that, um, you know, even if you're not meeting a director, going in to meet a casting director, you, yeah, there was something about the ceremony of it. I, I, ceremony is the wrong word. It was just what we did for 20 no, years. No, I, I, I said ritual. So I, 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 I will, yeah. the judges will accept ceremony. I, there is something right. just, yeah, it's, it's a protocol that we got really comfortable with yeah. that required a certain energetic shift that we won't necessarily have in front of a big gray sheet in our bedrooms, yeah. you know? And, and I, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah the, I the, the, the thing I do love is that being such a, I, like I, I have the room now to be the control freak that I always was. Like I can take now an hour and a half and you know make the perfect performance for you know lawyer Rubenstein, um, and uh, and that is that is a good thing. But I would I think I'd sacrifice that. I think I would give up the control for the the face to face and the nerves, a bit of the nerves and knowing that if I go past 9 minutes and I ask for a second I'll ask for I think I've earned the right to do a second take, but after that yeah. I know they've got other people in the other room. Okay, so you know you got to do it. You got to get off your ass. You're right. You you got to dive in and make it good in front of somebody else and I think that You're you're on I, somebody that's else's how I clock. What? Yeah, you're you're on somebody else's clock and that puts some fire under your ass in an interesting way where like if I if I whiff a line in front of Jamie, it's really no big. Right. But uh, I, I I I don't have that luxury when I go to a self tape place and it's been um I think it's been I think it's been pretty good for me. I don't know, we'll see. Well, I interviewed uh, Nelson Franklin a couple of months ago and he said it's killing him not to have the opportunity to sit in the hallway and be stressed out before going in for the for the read he said that's yes. that's where he, he he thrives is having that stress and knowing that you get one shot and that's it right. he's right. a machine nelson nelson books a lot nelson is a hustler um yeah. well, i also and this is a little weird but um once you crack once you get past 40 um I was, I've talked about this with a few other actors once you get past 40 and again as, as peter mentioned i'm 28 but once you get past 40 there is the, the herd thins a little bit and you you have a reliable group of middle-aged guys who are roughly your type um on the rare occasions peter was living in la he'd be in that in that that small group but he he was he was mostly uh he was mostly east coast but i it, it didn't it no longer psyched me out to see those guys it was actually yeah. kind of pleasant i you know like it was it. You know, it was actually kind of like, hey, what's up, yeah. Mark Evan Jackson? Nice to see you. Nelson Franklin had just aged into my group. He was suddenly <laughs> starting to go into after you because know, he's outgrown um, your your Scott Pogram roles now. So he's got to come out for the dads with me. <laughs> 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 Welcome, Nelson. It's a small boat, but we get by. Um, but yeah, I um, there was a, a social aspect that I... Um, I, I didn't mind. There were no, you know, there were no big alpha male douchebags in my type. So, right. you know, Me everybody too. was, was, was really pretty chill. Yeah, there was, I would sometimes walk into a room having just kibitz for the last 45 minutes in the waiting room. And that's another, that's a little Yiddish one for you, John. Thank you. Yeah, you for know. sure. Um, and um, yeah, so I remember sometimes just the feeling of, Oh, we're all in this, and uh, isn't it kind of sweet that we're friends and supportive of each other? I, you know, there were yes, of course you're tense, and you're like, oh shit, I wish she wasn't here. But everybody rose above that. I never had a moment of somebody doing what you tried to do to me at the AUSA test of like, you know, right. trying to bullshit me with the, you know. Um, other than that, everybody was always so friendly, and I remember actually being buoyed by that feeling of like, this is what we all do, and it's really fucking hard, and yet we're. We kind of love each other. I mean, that sounds yeah. sweet, but you know, it was there was something kind of nice about it. I heard a uh, a story about an actor whose work I enjoy, who I won't name. A little bit more of a lead guy than like he never. I never cross paths with this cat. Um, I'll I'll send you both separate emails. 
<laughs> but he would do a thing apparently where he would just he'd go in the Stop room. Foley. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, Foley doesn't audition anymore. But um, so the he would this particular actor, actor X, would go into the room and then he'd come out to the waiting room and say, "My God, it's packed in there." There's like six producers and the whole casting department's in there. It's crazy. And then you'd go in, there'd be like two people. There'd be a, 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 and it was just enough to fuck you up. Just enough to like throw you back on your heels just as you walked into the room. What What's wrong with me? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it was, uh, and it's as much as I, as I resent it, it's also quietly brilliant <laughs> oh yeah i got down to that that's genius that's a I mean, it's an it's it's dirty pool by any estimation but uh but the the sheer psychology of it is impressive <laughs> so i wonder how he's doing now that he's alone and he can't fuck with anybody he's like he like be, he beats his dog up and that gets no he's work, he's, his... he's working steadily you'll gasp when i give you the name <laughs> <laughs> um speaking of scott foley uh how is it working with mini driver i would have always wanted to know how that was and Minnie and I, we had worked together before. We had done, um, Jamie and I had actually played her bosses when she did the About a Boy remake for NBC. She, we, Jamie and I had a brief, like, two-episode arc where we played her boss. So I had met her, and I had honestly left our first day of shooting with Minnie with a sense of, like, she's really funny. She doesn't get to do comedy enough, but she's she's really funny. And it's so interesting. It was the weirdest thing because, you know, and, and enough people commented on it that I don't feel self-conscious mentioning it. We had a really easy comic chemistry together, and it was unusual because we're wildly different, you know, people, and she's taller than me, and it was just, you know, there was a real sense of, like, mm, he knocked her up one drunken night, and they're stuck together. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it worked, you know. We it, it was it was remarkable how well we played together. Um, okay. That was a fun gig. That was a speechless. Was a really really fun gig. We had um, how many seasons did you do? We did three. Wow, which is nothing to sneeze at. Um, Please, and you yeah, you know, what was, I would give for a network season. Just I one. know, dude. Just it was. One. 63 episodes, man. That was the most episodes I've ever shot of anything. 63 episodes is a lot, man. I believe me, I'm 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 enough of a student of this business to appreciate the rare air I was breathing yeah. Yeah, whilst yeah. it was going on, you know. And I um uh but we had we had a bunch of well, you remember the thing on 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 AUSA is that we had a ton of Simpsons writers, um, yeah. ton of Simpsons writers, uh, Richard Pell, Brent Forrester, uh, George Meyer came in a couple times a week. We had a couple Simpsons guys. We had a bunch of friends guys wow. on Speechless who were really good and really good joke writers. And then the rest of the people were, uh, there was a mishmash of, of people who maybe had more of a drama background, but actually had disability in their families. So they brought a certain extra insight. And then the rest were, were other animation people. So there was a level of surrealism on that show that I don't think we ever fully got credit for. We were marketed as like this sort of heartwarming weekly after school special. And I've probably said this to Will before. Um, I was a little frustrated with the way ABC sold us because there was a sense of like, you know, you're gonna you're gonna learn something if you watch this show. And and that honestly was not the point. It was silly, it was absurd. Our Halloween episodes were complete fucking anarchy. Yeah. They were uh they just got weirder and weirder each year. And I think by the last one, we were doing a thing where the kids ate old candy and got food poisoning, and the whole episode <laughs> was just their nightmares. <laughs> That's excellent. That is just, you know, that's good network writing, man. That's really It's good, good network story. writing, right? We had that's really impressive. adventurous stuff. Um, but yeah, no, no regrets. And the other nice thing is that um, uh, nothing dies. It's still there. I've been sitting there on Hulu anytime you want to watch yeah. it, you know. And, that's and one I, thing I, have noticed, I have noticed an uptick in people commenting on shows that I didn't think were necessarily running in the last few years because everybody's just sitting around watching more TV, even though we're out and about now. I think, right. like, who's going to stop watching TV that way? And so there's been sort of like, hey, I, you know, sorry that you're Will and Grace episode from, you know, 1938. <laughs> and the Roosevelt references were so funny. Um, <laughs> I love uh, me some New Deal comedy. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
New Steel Company. That's the show. That's the show that we're going to do. A couple of middle-aged white guys doing a, a, a New Deal comedy. I, I love it. Hey, we're it um, the WPA Follies, I'm in. Um, I have <laughs> lost so much of your audience, Will. I am alienating. This is my audience. I, every, I, I hope so. I hope so. Because <laughs> if I... My God, if my references were any more dated. Um, here, the other amazing rapper you have worked with is is uh, The Pinnacle, uh, LL Cool J, with whom you oh worked on God, NCIS that's LA. That's and it. that was what the moment when I was like, that's it. Peter's done it. Peter has that's worked with three of the greatest rappers of all time. And I'm, and I'm doing a pilot with Cheech. No, I'm kidding. I, I wish. I wish. <laughs> you know yeah, why didn't I go up for that? Um, no, I wish. That's right. LL Cool J. He was th that guy. He scared me for a while. Really? How so? Just, he's so, just so cool. Just so, I mean, certainly he's a of course of sweet. That's what they say. The what? That's what they say. But yeah. Very cool. he, he, put it in his name. Um, I thought, I just was. I, I'm told, actually, I have it on very good authority, the ladies love Cool J. Yes, not true. Yeah, I think, I think I'm correct about that. Yeah. You're correct, yes. Yeah, I've never been, um, I've gotten a chance to work with some heavy hitters in their shadows and seen a fair amount of like, you know, oh my God, out, you know, shooting here or there. Like yeah, yeah. Fact, going to the Super Bowl with uh, fo following Hugh Laurie through the uh, <laughs> Texas Stadium uh, grandstand area before he got to the VIP section um, was, I would, I imagine was like people following Jesus through Nineveh <laughs> or something. It was like the crowd, it was unbelievable. But that's another story. Um, But like we were shooting a thing in a, car in like long beach ll cool j, ll and i um i don't know he, no he's got a name that is not ll cool j and everybody calls him that and i don't remember what it was is it james it i know people I call him james it, i think it's no i don't know I don't do know. they call him the pinnacle that means he reigns supreme and he's notorious he will crush you like a jelly bean i think that's it is that it okay great yeah. so i was working with the pinnacle who crushes you like a jelly bean and i we were driving in one like a slow car with the camera mounted to yeah, this yeah. long beach like which the by the way people who watch tv don't realize how terrifying that is driving <laughs> a car that has a camera mounted on it there's a gazillion <laughs> thing the fact that that doesn't break bad all the time is astonishing right. Right. But, but carry on and more people aren't dead even they were that's the point. The people were going so fucking nuts over this guy, like, <laughs> no, no, like, like you couldn't get it. You could not get a word in edgewise, no matter and how you have I said you were, wherever you were, Mike, you it should. didn't matter. And then they were like all over. blind spot. They would get You're... run over and be like, your guts were all past us on the, on the street. <laughs> that guy is cool. And people love that guy. That's pretty cool. amazing. That's Did you so get to work with you and Jamie worked a lot together? more or we have we've done a, a fairly steady well here's the thing jamie and i met doing improv and that is on our resumes and as such we book a lot of the improv shows together so we did a battery of reno 911s we did a fairly a fairly popular curb episode mm -hmm. that um gets put on um it has like one, there's one scene where Larry is being awful to us that is such a, a, a perfect Larry being awful moment that it showed up on like 60 Minutes, which mm -hmm. my in-laws lost their mind. Six oh my minutes. God. Why was it on, why, why was it on 60 Larry minutes? David was being interviewed, you know, sort of like a 20 year retrospective of Larry David's career. And they showed this one clip from Curb Your Enthusiasm that their daughter and, and that that Shagat she married was on and it was uh they lost their minds but yeah we've worked together a fair amount we used to do a lot of commercials together in new york um uh we did a we did a hot in cleveland together um with uh you know with everybody on hot in cleveland which would you ever get to do that show hot in cleveland no no it it's not sunny, sunny in philadelphia but not hot in cleveland no. okay <laughs> um if i get it you did the edgier cooler one fine yeah no. good, weird flex dude but um the <laughs> You know, Hot in Cleveland was what it was, but they could get anybody they wanted because everybody wanted a photo with Betty White. So it's me and Dave Foley on set. And then <laughs> Bill Bellamy. Do you remember the comedian Bill Bellamy uh, yeah. was on? And Bill Bellamy is actually literally the guy who, he doesn't get credit for this, but he coined the term booty call. <laughs> really? By hand he, to God. He, he, he coined... says that? He's, how is that? How is that? How, how do we know? It's the earliest recorded stand-up that mentions that term. What a 2 a.m. phone call from a relative stranger means, that's Bill Bellamy's bit. He coined booty call. But he why, why is he not known as Bill 
booty call booty Bellamy. Call, that's if it was up to me, if you vote for me, he will be. All right. By the way, I'm using this platform to announce my candidacy. I'm not sure for well, what. Well, we'll get to your book before we get to your candidacy, which I want to hear more about your book. But, but so, people. but so, Bill Bellamy comes up to us at one point, and it's it's a multi cam. So you're even if you don't have scenes with the guy, you're there all week. It's everybody's at the same food truck the whole week, which is kind of magical. And like Peter and I actually didn't have a ton of scenes together, but we always ended up, you know, hanging out all the time and doing the right. crossword together. Um, but nice. but Bill Bellamy comes up to my wife and I and goes, "Let me get this straight." Y'all are actually married. I'm like, yeah. Goes, and you're playing a married couple on TV. And we said, yes. And he goes, that is so gangsta. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of things. Um, <laughs> gangsta? <laughs> this is TV land is where we are. We're on the CBS Radford lot shooting with Valerie Bertinelli. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that we can call it gangsta. It's not that I don't super appreciate it. And I, I shouldn't look this gift in, a, in the mouth. But um Gangsta words should mean things. <laughs> I was uh, Red Man called me Pimpin, which I thought was sort of pretty cool. I'll take that. Fantastic! <laughs> I bet he fact, did. Let's just call me Pimpin for the rest of this thing. I'm fine, Pimpin Peter. Um, um Pimpin PJ. You know, I do actually have one stock question. I would like to get to at least. <laughs> hit it! Yeah, hit it. <laughs> Who was the first person that you worked with where you had to fight back the urge to fanboy? Oh man. Oh, to fight bat. Oh, yeah. Well, well I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I, I excluding, I, excluding. Kate, I did obviously. not fight back the urge. It's my point. Mm -hmm. I, I, I put all my cards on the table right out of the gate. Um, <laughs> uh, you've probably got some buttes, Peter. My God, I mean, you've worked yeah, with. Good one. Um, the one. Uh, uh, well, if you've ever auditioned for Woody Allen, you know that you're not supposed to say anything. <laughs> um, and so there wasn't a chance to fanboy, but it was such a weird experience because I was told to just, you're like, don't say anything because he doesn't like it, you know, just be quiet. Um, uh, but it was for this, this scene in, uh, deconstructing Harry. They just needed a guy who sort of looked like Woody Allen. Like there were a bunch of Woody Allens in the movie. <laughs> no speaking of, I went in and Julia Taylor was there and, and, uh, in New York in like the lobby of this beautiful hotel. And uh, she was like, don't say anything, don't say anything. I was like, okay. And I stand there. And he comes out, and I was like, I, I want to say something. But I didn't say anything, and he just looks at me, looks down, looks up, and goes, <laughs> and then walks out. <laughs> and that was it. Um, I got the part. but uh, So that's not really to really answer your question. That was when I wanted to fanboy, uh, but couldn't. Um, I spent enough time with Robert Duvall on the set of A Civil Action as his like top legal aid. So I was mm -hmm. next to him for like six weeks and I, we got, wound up talking and chatting and he is, I, to me, he is the greatest film actor that, you know, of, of certainly of that generation. And I, I just think he, that, you know, there are so many greats, but I, I just, I always come back to Duvall and to sort of see that up close was amazing. But every day I was having trouble keeping from like, you know, like, you're Santini. Get Godfather. It's just, it's just, it just rolls out. There one like, there's a whole decade you forget about, and then like on the fifth day of shooting, I'm like, it would just sort of strike me, and it was almost like I had this sort of Tourette's thing where I couldn't stop just shooting out the names of the movies, and um, but I controlled myself after about week two. But I was so close, like right next to him for so long, and he would try to engage in sort of a normal, nice conversation, and I could do it. But it was, it took about a month to stop sweating and to stop blurting out, you know, names of movies um, until I finally got cool. And then he treated me like the star he knew that I was. Um, well, it, it's, it. it's such a fine line because you, you want to appreciate the opportunity you're being given to work with someone whose work you admire, but you also need them to remember that you are for all intents and purposes, a colleague. And it is, it is a very, it is very hard to walk that line. You kind of have to turn off the fanboy a little bit. And mm -hmm. that again, took me a couple of years to, to learn that. Um, I worked, I did just one day, speaking of Woody Allen, I did one day with Diane Keaton on a movie called Because I Said So. And it, um, she was awesome and she, you know, she's, she's Annie Hall. I mean, that character is based on her and she talks like that and she interrupts herself and, and she has this, that cadence, that Chippewa Falls cadence is real. Yeah. And she's much more Annie Hall than she is Kay Corleone. And I, 
I, I remained cool. And it's funny. I, I always felt a little bit weird about this. The other guys in the scene were all like, fuck this shit. I am getting a photo with Diane Keaton. And I held back. So a friend of mine has photos all over his house of, of him and Diane Keaton that I took <laughs> without at any point asking to get a photo with her now myself. That is the definition of cool. That was restraint, dude. That was fucking restraint. And it, it was the end of the workday. I wasn't coming back. I absolutely could have gotten a photo, but I, I, cool. I got really in my head and was like, no, I just don't feel like I'm there yet with you her. You were cool. You, that was cool. I and had, eventually, you know, I got, I did get to that. Obviously, I got, you know, three years with Minnie. I was able to be like, you know, Jesus, what was the set like on, you know, on, on Goodwill, on, on, um, uh, Gross Point Blank, which is probably my, my favorite Mini Driver movie. Um, uh, you know, we had some big night talks. Um, you know, uh, it was, there was points where I got comfortable enough to just ask sort of, where it felt a little less fanboy and a little more colleague to colleague. Like, oh, what was that gig like? We've had gigs. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting because there's, I think a lot depends on who it is. And it's hard to have this conversation without feeling name droppy. But like, I, I did a, uh, like a, a day or two next to Robert De Niro um, in uh, uh, What Just what Happened, is which is a Barry Levinson film. And right. he was the star of the, I was a, a neurotic director and we had like a long walk and talk. And it was a lot of work. And he's so in it and sort of, and he seemed shy to me. Uh, and so I never felt the whole day I want, you know, I didn't want to fanboy him. I just wanted to, I wanted to hit, I just wanted to feel like we were, we were colleagues and right. Um, Cause you're playing he, colleagues. Yes. And, right. and because, and because he's shy and his process is what it is, it's intense. And I look, I mean, I, I don't know anywhere near enough about him to know what he's like on other sets, but I've, I've heard that he's shy. And so, you know, and, you know, but that's his work. That's what makes him great. That's his process. And, and there wasn't a lot of access. Again, I wasn't looking to chum it up at all. You want to keep that distance, but I felt myself sort of sweating the whole day because I tell stories like that in my head because he shows up as he does. And it's not the picture of like, Hey, I start to tell stories in my head and he's just doing his thing. So that was a tougher day for me. Contrast that with uh, Jack Nicholson, where I got to spend three days doing just one, once the big scene in as good Oh, as the it restaurant gets, scene is a good where he gets, comes right. in And interesting. I played another part, like with the Woody Allen thing where I just had to be Jewish. It was really, I don't know why this happens, but um, it was me and Lisa Edelstein at the table. Just oh, was that Lisa Edelstein? Edelstein. Yes. Oh, this is well before oh half. Um, and so, but it was such a long, complicated scene and they did it at a restaurant in LA supposed to be in New York and they took three days to shoot. It was just, they took forever to do it. And so for three days, Lisa and I were sitting in this booth and they would do one section of it. And Jack, who had a lot of time in between would come and sit down at the booth with us. And he just like, blah, 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 blah. The easiest, sweetest, like we learned about his family. It was so after what, like after about half a day, it was like, you didn't even know it was him. He was so easy and so out there, whatever his, I mean, he won an Oscar for that part. And whatever right. his process was, was different from, from De Niro's. And, but I just felt like I didn't even, I, I, I was no longer tense and I didn't, we were just having conversations. So I wasn't fanboying. I was just talking to him like a colleague and, and that had to do with him. I mean, those guys set the tone. And um, they just set different tones. It's interesting because it it begs the question, like, what is going to get the best work out of people? And I, I'm of the opinion that I do my best work when I'm, you know, I, a little bit of nerves and, and, and butterflies isn't painful. You know, it isn't going to, you know, slow me down at this point. But I do do my best work when I'm comfortable and I'm relaxed. I know who everybody is right. and people have introduced themselves, um, which is rarer than it should be. Yeah. If I if I am a guest star, that makes you a host star. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I, I've heard that about Nicholson in particular that he he just genuinely loves the work and loves other actors yeah. and and that. and that comes across and sets a tone. What was Brooks like to work with on that movie? Because he he remains one of my he's he's directed a couple of my absolute all time favorite movies. Um, I I just my memory was so you know, hugely Nicholson that I, that. Right, right. Um, and I don't remember him like coming up and he wasn't like, can you be a little more Jewish? There wasn't a whole lot to, you know. I mean, why, who would it. dare? <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of artistic interaction. Um, to me, he just seemed like a lovely 
sweet guy. He was like, nothing seemed to bother him and he didn't seem to be stressed. And I just remember him being really in control and lovely. And he and Nicholson had a really nice rapport. And so, you know, that sets a tone in contrast. I just, my most recent, uh, a, a recent one, and he's an incredible actor. I just don't, you know, his process is his process and it's notoriously intense as Jared Leto. I think it's Leto, is it not? I've heard his- Oh, name. I've always said Leto. I okay. thought that too. I wouldn't want to correct it. I, I don't know. Um, I, I was not going to correct him on it when I, um, he said, it's Jared Leto, nice to meet you. I said, no, it's Leto. Um, no, he doesn't, <laughs> well, that's just the point. There was no, he was in, he was like, you hear that about Joaquin Phoenix. It's like, it's the moment you set foot, there are those actors, or Daniel Day-Lewis, it's like, they're in it and they are gone. And yeah. so there's no introduction. And for me, I'm like, all right, I'm older than this guy. He's, an Oscar winner and fabulous and I respect the hell out of him but you know hello how are you nice to meet you we're doing this together we want to talk about the scene that ain't happening and it took me about you know a few minutes to kind of get over my own bullshit about that and then right you know, he's there he is there and if you join him then yeah. you get great shit and I you know I, and I I, I had, after about my, my four tense minutes, I wound up having a blast because he was so there. Now, again, totally different from other guys. And, and that's the beauty of the, you know, of what, you know, it's just different all the time, every day. Um, I just I just finished a book that a guy named Isaac Butler wrote that is on the history of the method um, that goes from, starts with like a letter uh, uh, that was written to Stanislavski by an actor in Moscow saying, hey, we should we should get together and, and you know, disrupt theater for eternity. And then yeah. ends with, you know, discussions of Daniel Day-Lewis and, and that, and, and the various ways the method has been misinterpreted and what has been ascribed to Strasbourg, which is actually Stella Adler and, and right. all that, like the incredible amount of misinformation that is out there. And you don't leave there, you leave there oddly enough with the sense of that film title, nobody knows anything, you know, but what, as you know, I'm, I'm horrifically insecure about my lack of a formal theater education. Um, and I, well you I should be, thank you. And I, um, I know you're kidding, but I will lose sleep. So the um, <laughs> I couldn't but, be more kidding. I couldn't. But where? Um, but what was was there a particular dogma that you felt was being presented to you at Juilliard, or was it what works for you? Were there particular teachers who were like, "This is how it did. This is sense memory. This is animal exercises." Like well, what? It, what do you remember from? I remember this is so long ago now. Um, uh, I do remember. The acting te the first year acting teacher, John Sticks, who was this wonderful man, he was, he and, he and, and Lee Straw, he was at the actor studio. In fact, the, the legend was that there were, he was, he and Lee Strasberg were auditioning people sometime in the 50s. And one very handsome, sexy man came in and Strasberg was like, no, 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 after the read. And this John Sticks was like, no, 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 bring him back. You got it. And Strasberg was like, no, no bring him back, bring him back. And it was James Dean. Oh, James I was going to guess Brando, but okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, second, next best. Yeah. So this guy was steeped in, you know, um, Meisner. And, and I mean, he'd worked with these guys. So right. my memory first in acting class was this is very method, crunchy, feely. But by the time you got past that first year acting, there was so much technique being thrown on you. Um, and I wouldn't, I would, I was going to say dogma-less, um, but it just... I don't think they were able to escape this, you know, their, their feeling that technique is what you need in order to allow the other stuff to come through. But what often happened, the, the, the scuttlebutt on Juilliard actors coming out at the time, and it was very stressful. It was, it was not a friendly technique. Um, it was break you down and then, you know, get rid of that accent that you have and get rid of that slouch and get rid of, you know, what, what makes you you. Um, and that was always befuddling to me. Um, don't necessarily use that, I felt was, was what they were saying. And then the scuttlebutt was that, you know, you, you know, you could always tell a Juilliard actor auditioning because he sounded like this and looked like this. And yeah, no one really actually fair. talks like this. <laughs> that's not really fair. I think it was just probably right. you're, you're trying to shake it off. And then eventually you've got, you've got fabulous actors coming out of that school. But that was something that I remember having to, wanting to fight against was this technique that feels stiff to me 
and not me. Like, where do I bring me into it? And uh, Will, do you know what you know what Alexander technique is? Yeah, we had uh, heard the phrase i actually don't know what that means it's like a sort of a postural realignment it's the unholy mix between uh movement and chiropractic i guess you know and it, it <laughs> and you can tell it. you can tell the alexander trained actors because there it there is legit there is legitimately a stiffness to them <laughs> and you know there's anybody who can get Which past exactly anything it's supposed to be the other way around the point it's of supposed it to loosen you up yeah it's, relaxation yeah, it's supposed to loosen you up, but they get into this like incredible perfect posture that like nobody has. You know, C three PO doesn't have this posture. What are you doing? You know, um, what you need to do is you need to like work at a fast food joint for like six weeks and see how people stand. You know, and, and that's you know. But it, it's it's so interesting because there's people who who take just a little bit of the training and pollute it. Uh, or say like, oh, you know, I, I've done half the work and this isn't for me. And like, well, no, you know, the idea is to get the technique so you can get to the emotional stuff quicker and then work but forward from there. But that's hard to do, especially at Juvenile. Yeah. They had a lot of kids out of high school. You got 18 year olds and I would just finish college and 22 is, you know, I had four years of thinking I was hot shit in college as an actor. That That's young, however you slice it. And I, you know, I think it's, uh, it is a lifelong learning. And if you get, stuffed with something early i think it sometimes doesn't help now I couldn't agree more. did you do how much time did you spend in new york john when you i mean well you, I, I i i grew up there what i did my ten thousand hours was when i when i decided that i was like I'm, i want to be an actor i was 27 i had i had taught oh high God, school so yeah that was super it was late comparatively late um you know there's there's people like uh John Mahoney got a later start. Um, I want to say Phil Hartman got a later start. Um, Kathy Houston, do you remember Kathy? She was on our I show do. briefly. My, my son and I watched West Wing all through COVID, and every time she popped up, I was like, "Did you hear that Chicago accent?" Because she actually grew up right down the street from me. That's right. Yeah. So Mrs. Langingham was on AUSA with us for about five of our eight episodes or so, <laughs> and she, she got she got a late start too. But I had like. I had harbored a dream to be an actor, but growing up around them in the theater district, like literally down the street from the actor's studio, I was like, this looks like a really hard life. Uh, these people are fucking crazy and angry. And <laughs> I, I don't know how this is sustainable. So I tried a bunch of other jobs before I finally said, well, I have to at least give this a try or I'll never forgive myself. And I kind of, even then, I wasn't able to like fully commit. I was like, well, I'll do improv because improv, you sort of have one foot in, one foot out. You know, there's a, right. a, a layer of ironic detachment that I think is protecting you from, you know, was there, exercises. Was there an improv structure there? Like in Chicago, you could go to Second City and work with Del Close and Sharon Hepburn and do the, the Herald. But was that? Yeah, it, it was all. LA, it was all certainly, I saw you in L.A. do your improv and that world is there. It, it, it was all of Dell and Sharna's students had just moved to New York. And um, mm -hmm. so it was all people who had studied under Dell and Sharna and um, uh, a lot of those, uh, um, Andy, uh, Andrew Alexander at the Second City, and a lot of those legends over there had just moved to New York. And the core group was the Upright Citizens Brigade, and they were teaching us the Herald. Oh, they were started in New York. Oh, I... They were Chicago people who moved to New York, and that's where they opened their training center. But then they then they opened it in L.A. I, then they did an L.A. thing, and now they're in a weird sort of limbo, which is a whole separate podcast. But um, you, you were you grew up in Hell's Kitchen when it was fucking Hell's Kitchen. I mean, it's, it was Hell's Kitchen. Like that now. You <laughs> literally, you literally, if you watch that TV show, The Deuce, yeah. um, uh, about about Hell's Kitchen in the in the seventies, there was a shot of my block. <laughs> it was what? Uh, in the opening credits. <laughs> well, was where were you? What, where, where did you? Uh, I, I was on Forty Fourth between Ninth and Tenth, literally like across the street and down from the actor's studio, that old Greek Orthodox white church. Yes. And then next to that, or two doors down from that, is the new Dramatist, where you probably uh, put in some time, yes. which is sort of a an unofficial playwright. It's not really a union, but sort of a right. like a guild of some sort. Right. I don't walk. think they have negotiating power, but right. they they're a they're a hang. Um, and then. I where were you? Everyone lived in Hell's Kitchen at one point. Where were you? Uh, no, I was on my, I, when I grew up, my last two years at Juilliard, and then my first two years afterwards, I was on 40, I was on ninth between 48th and 49th above Mazella's Produce Market. Um, Got it. 
and he's uh, still there. And, uh, you know, staircase like this that smelled like cat piss and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. a, a, what do you call it? A train? A, 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 what kind of apartment where you walk through? Every railway. Railway. And uh, yeah. It was, and that was, and I was there in the 80s and they were like, they were literally, you would see crack vials on the corners, yes. like, you know, crack vials on the corners. Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was propositioned uh by a sex worker whilst walking to school one morning at in like 10th grade 10th you think i'm boyish now you should have seen me when i was 15 <laughs> I, I remember when you were 28 um, and uh <laughs> i and this woman comes up to me out of the shadows of ninth avenue want to go i'm like no, i'm just gonna i had an algebra <laughs> test this morning and i want to gotta keep my wits about me thank you though <laughs> so then, did the you, then did you come to la at, at like right away or did you i i did about four years in new york well the, my four years in new york were interesting my four years as an actor in new york for three and a half years um i got commercial work really quickly and got into the union and that was awesome and but i could not there wasn't you know it's funny there was not as much production in this is like right at the turn of the century this is 2000 99 2000 there was not as much production there was law and order which would not see me for whatever reason and i every like six months i would go in for spin city and it would and that was it that, that was, was pretty it. much, and and then there were, and then there were the soaps, which have no use for me. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do I, on a soap. I know, I know why you didn't get in for Law and Order, but we can talk about that on your podcast. I'll let you. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I have a feeling it. It. It's. I mean, there was there. All there was was like three years of improv on. You know, there was no like theater degree or anything. Mm -hmm. I, I have an English degree from an okay college, um, but there's no like there's no MFA sitting there. We're like, Oh, this guy can, this guy, you know, played Tartuffe when he was 19. He can absolutely be witness number one, you know? Thank God um, for Conan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, the other thing, the other, the other big gig at the time was you could do little gigs uh, in sketches on Conan O'Brien. Oh, right. Cause he was still in New York and late night would do um, all these gags where they would have like, they used to do the bit called the staring contest which was, uh, the gag was Andy challenges, uh, or Conan challenges Andy to a staring contest. But throughout the whole staring contest, crazy things happened behind Conan to break Andy. So they needed, they, for one of those, they would need, I'm not exaggerating, 20 actors who would come in for after extra pay, which by the way, was all your utility bills. <laughs> that, would, that was your utility bills taken care of for the month. Rent, you needed to actually talk. But um, for, uh, for utility <laughs> bills, you book right. a staring contest and you're right as rain. But there would be like crazy bits like, you know, you were uh, uh, someone comes up to you and asks you for the time. And I suddenly turn and I reveal that I'm a hunchback and a bell comes down and I ring it three times. <laughs> and he goes, OK, great, thanks. And it was a ridiculous, like laughing style sight gags behind Conan. And but that was it. That was those were the those were the gigs in New York at the time. There was no Thirty Rock. I was yeah. never really on the SNL track. I was not that kind that's of. That's a that's a terrifying track anyway. Terrifying track anyway. Yeah, I don't think I have the the, I remember, the I, wherewithal. I was, they I was asked to go in one time for that like, and they were like, yeah, they're looking for new people. And I'm like, I do comedy, but I'm not I, like that's about creating characters. And yeah. they, you know, and they were like, you know, go in with bring your three characters in. And I was like, I have. Like, I don't know, you know, drunk guy peeing on a, you know, on a something. I don't have anything. So that was, that scared the shit out. I, I just have, I somewhat like you, I have variations of this. And uh, this is what I bring to the table. And it has served me well. But yeah, so I got out to LA and, uh, and I swear to God, I was so, it was the opposite of a cautionary tale. I was, I was there less than two months before I booked AUSA. I booked you a pilot that, that went to LA. the series. I didn't, dude, you don't even remember this. I did not know how to drive for the pilot. I took the that subway. I, I took the subway I in LA <laughs> and walked through downtown to get to those weird, like way the hell down in like Repo Man LA. Right, right. I, 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 I took the subway and I get there and I was I was not sweaty, but I had a little, I was a little schwitzy. Um, yeah. And, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, the AD was like, oh, where'd you park? I'm like, oh, I didn't park. I just took the subway, got off it. I think it's called, I think it's called Pershing Square. And then I walked over here and the AD was like, don't ever do that again. You talk to Transpo, do not do that again. And I, I seriously was like, I just don't want to start any trouble. I just, I don't have my license yet. I'm so I, sorry. 
I, that was a big that was a big thing. You did not have your license. I remember that very well. I thought it was because that you were 15, but that was, you know, no, you I was, were I all was, just waiting. It, was just, this it wasn't that York. you were just weird, but yeah, you grew up in Manhattan. Why should you have a goddamn license? My parents didn't own a car, and when my parents did drive, they were fucking terrible drivers. <laughs> <laughs> May they both rest. They were fucking terrible drivers. Both of them, my my high school didn't offer driver's ed. Most of my teachers didn't why? drive. It was just, they were, why would you? It's it, mm-hmm. yeah. So I, I remember like learning to drive and getting a very reasonable used Honda and, and showing up uh, at, uh, at the Fox lot when we switched over to the, um, to the multicam and right. we shot it all on a sound stage and just having so oh. much joy in like getting to bitch about traffic with everybody else. It just been like, Oh, the 10 was murder this morning. Huh? <laughs> and I felt like I, I am an adult. I have done this now. <laughs> Did we have our own parking spaces? I don't think we did. I think we were still in the parking garage. We couldn't. That's oh, right. We, we, were, in, we were in the parking garage. That's right. Yeah, we were in the parking really, garage. Yeah. I think Scott had his own parking spot. Scott had the <laughs> nicest car I'd ever seen in my life up close. He had a car. I had never even seen theatrical lighting in a car. And what I mean by that is you'd open the door and the lights would fade in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. Like I, 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 Spending time in New York, I didn't. I, well, living in New York, it, the car was not a thing, and so when I was but you would learn, you would probably you would learn. I, well, I grew up in Chicago, Chicago, so I knew, yeah. yeah, I knew how to drive, but it just like like my car as an extension of me was not something I understood when I no. started working more regularly in LA, and because I was in the parking structure with you for AUSA, didn't care. But then when I was on house, I was on house. Did you know I was on house? I had heard you. Are. I We're going to get to house. Yes. We're going to get to house. Yeah. I just want to be clear about that. Um, <laughs> we all had our own spots. And I came in with my, you know, like I, I was the first season or the, when I first was made a regular, I, I just didn't have a, I hadn't really leased a car. I was still renting a car. And so I came right. with, you know, like, a, I don't know what, I don't care about cars. It wasn't a big deal to me, but Robert Sean Leonard had a Volkswagen Jetta and <laughs> He insisted to me that that's what I needed. And so I went out and leased a Volkswagen Jetta because it was said Peter Jacobson. And then it mattered what kind of car you had until somebody, I think Olivia Wilde told me that indeed that's what 16 year old girls get for their first birthday. If they're wealthy, their family, they get a Volkswagen Jetta. I was like, well, Robert told me to get it. And suddenly I was stuck in the maelstrom of identity and sexuality connected to my car. I, that meant that nothing sound, to me. That sounds like our stuck. boy. Yeah, I got over. I got over. Look, you can jet is super safe. You can park it anywhere. It's a little roller skate of a thing. I love it. <laughs> it's a great car. It's a great car. I still, I, I am pleased to report that the reason I've been able to stay afloat through the ups and downs is that I, my car is a big metal backpack that I put shit in and I, I get it from A to B. And by not getting. <laughs> There was an actor who leased a Porsche the first week of AUSA, and, and he, as green <laughs> as I was, I was like, that's not a good idea, not man. Good. I remember. Uh, bad idea, dude. I really <laughs> wouldn't recommend that. I know nothing about anything. I just learned how to drive. I just yeah. moved here. That's a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to... Wanna... What's up? I would say a certain level of innocence, even forced fake innocence, is, I think, essential to getting over the initial hump of making it. I think so. I think so. <laughs> How was House? Because House was like, speaking of American Idol, the way those episodes of House were structured, it was almost like yeah. this weird Hunger Games where like, which one of these vaguely oh, recognizable totally. actors will well, they, survive? They literally had like, he had like the sort of like the stick and the flame and the thing at the end. Yeah, we were, there were, there were a few of us who knew, five of us knew we were, we were going to be the final five. So the first batch of like 25, that was, we knew who was going. And then by about the fourth or fifth episode of that, that season, they whittled it down to the final five. And it literally was a, a survivor game. We would, you know, we would, uh, we were just sort of waiting to see when the axe would fall. And it, but it was actually turned out to be great because it was so potentially stressful and horrible that it kind of bonded us instead. It was like, this is so nuts. And, and for me, you know, just a festering pit of neurosis. Um, I, I was saved that by the Indian guy you mentioned and uh, and the other actors who were um, who were all on. It was a lovely, everybody got along. So we, we sort of bonded in the hell of it. But yeah, it was weird. It was definitely weird. It wasn't until those who then got cut, they would, you know, 
I mean, they told them before they saw the script, but we didn't know when we finished an episode, we did not know, you know, if we were going to make it. Weird. We, that is a really strange way to, was, to, to run a show, but it was, it, it injected, it injected some life into it. And you had a good time. I mean, Hugh Laurie is supposed to be a lovely guy to work with. He's got I, a great again, reputation. Like, I'm trying to think about how I was terrified again for a few weeks. Um, and then just, he's the, a doll. I mean, there's it's it's scary to be around a, somebody that smart and that funny all at once. I mean, I know really smart. You can't be that funny if you're not smart, and you can't be that smart if you're not funny. I think in some ways, but he's just he's a protean. I mean, it's like it's a it's a level of talent and and that I it's just sort of weird. So, but once you get you know, for me, it was just about getting beyond uh, the initial intimidation. And, and he had a lot on his plate. I mean, he he had a lot on his shoulders. And so he was very focused and he set the bar really high. And there were moments, especially with Cal and I, where we were, you know, we fucked off a bit. And there were a couple of days when it was very clear that we were not prepared enough. And Hugh could let you know that was like, it wasn't even like a glance. It was like, a, you know, he hadn't even, he didn't begin the glance. You just felt something come out of his you know, the lower part of his eye socket and you knew you was like, <laughs> oh shit, I'm not showing up here in the way that I should be. And sure enough, I was marched up to the producer's office and uh, got my shit together quickly. But he's just a gem. I mean, it's just so funny. It's rid ridiculous. Well, he's got, it, he's, you know, it's funny because we, in America, we, we, he's house um, but we, you know, he's, he cut his teeth with the Cambridge footlights. He's one of those goofy guys. He did a young ones. You go back, yeah, you did. can find him on an episode of the young yeah. ones. He, yeah. uh, you know, and obviously Fry and Laurie, but like, yeah. he's a big goofy sketch comedy guy yeah. who has a wonderful face and an aura about him that screams authority. So he's great at pompous beast, but he's also at guy who really has his shit together. He's really good at that too. And and I'm glad that uh, what is it, Avenue Five? Is it called Avenue Five? Oh, the, yeah, that the the, the the space show that he's done. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, that That's gives him a bigger. Um, yeah, they 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 got delayed by COVID, but they've got a second season coming out, oh, I good. think. And it's um uh, it gives him a chance to 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 show his full kind of dry wit, but also his his goofiness. I mean, not that House didn't get a chance to be funny. House absolutely got a chance to be funny occasionally. Yeah. He was the smartest guy in the room, but it's it's neat to watch him show America everything he can do. Yeah, yeah. And he's also fantastic on Veep. Oh, he's great on Veep. That's yeah. right. Fucking yeah. hell, that's right. <laughs> sort of annoying after a while. It's like, all right. <laughs> I get it. You're gifted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he's, a, he's an author too I mean he writes novels and he's obviously a great musician yeah. pretty cool yeah, I got his book The Gun Seller yes yes so I remember that That's I, gotta, cool. I, I should read a few I, I read a Stephen Fry book that I really liked he's written a few but I, I remember reading one that I really really enjoyed and I should absolutely give a Hugh Laurie book a shot here's I have a Stephen Fry story about how smart he was I don't know if I want to take time with that I kind of I want to hear about your book if you I'll, I'll allow it. <laughs> um, yeah, let's let's do Stephen Ryan, Stephen Fry, and then we'll we'll segue. Just remember. in terms of the, I think that he and Hugh were probably the two smartest, fastest brains on the planet, which is why that they will live on forever. And then I would this uh, Civil Action movie that I did with Robert Duvall. How did you? Is it typical to feel like a name dropping douchebag on this? Well, I, I don't think there's a way around it. I don't think there's any way around it. Because right, I don't yeah. like doing that, but it's what we're talking about. It's the absolutely you no. Know, feel free. And, um, I've been around the bend. So there was a scene in a civil action, which is all about this poisoned water. It's like before Aaron Brockovich, it was, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's a great book. And, a, and I think a really wonderful movie. And they built this, they won the big trial scene where they're trying to prove how polluted the water is. They built this, the defense or the, pro, one of the sides has built this huge mock aquifer system that's in the middle of the courtroom. And the geeky scientist know it all, um, who's coming in to, as the star, you know, expert testifying witness is Stephen Fry. And he's, uh, 
they're timing the shot, the great, uh, I, I, right, I'll keep going. Um, they're timing the shot <laughs> to be, to be, um, Conrad Hall was the DP who was, oh, wow. All right. Great, yeah. not, great DPs. And he was doing this incredible long shot that was catching the glint off the ice from the water glass around, you know, the, the, the witness stand onto the aqua thing onto fry. And it was, and he had to hit about a page of dialogue to time, just talking about all the science of it, to, to, to match the shot. They finished the shot. They, they were taking too long to get the shot, the camera to move. And without even realizing it, Stephen Fry added a whole nother two pages of just talking. And that was, we were all like, wait, we didn't hear that before because the camera was moving so slowly. He literally, without missing a beat, just kept talking as that witness. Like he didn't go ahead and study aquifers and water pollution. He's just was able to either he got shit right or he was masking it. I'm telling you another full 60 seconds of, of just monologue about the science. Improvised expert do. testimony. Yeah, you, yes, he improvised. You can do that if you're with somebody else and they fill in the gap, but but it was seamless. It wasn't until about 30 seconds in that everybody was like, wait a minute, that's not, um, like people are looking at their sides under the thing, like that's that's all him. And it was over, we were all like, <laughs> oh my God. It was like the smart, like nobody else can do anything like that. Anyway. That's incredible. Yeah, I'm a, I, I like those guys a lot. They're really interesting. They're, I mean, they're from that British school where you do everything. You know, you 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 write a little bit and maybe you direct and you just, you bounce around, you do comedy, you do drama. And it's- yeah, You feel like, you feel like John Cleese, John Cleese could have done that. I mean, they are a direct line from the, the all-time greats, I think. I've told Will this story. I'll be brief about it. I got to work with Cleese. He played my- Please he tell played, it again. Yes, please. He, he, he played my father-in-law in on Speechless in season oh, three. He wow. played Minnie's dad. And I, uh, I, I, well, a couple of things. One, somewhere out there, there is footage of me doing a little bit of business while the camera was on Cleese and me cracking him up in the middle of a take. That's heaven. So okay. that's heaven. <laughs> so that's heaven. Because you'll be shocked to learn from looking at me that, yes, as a matter of fact, I can recite Holy Grail from memory. <laughs> 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 oh, what's that he going to show us? Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> I got too jealous about Cleese. I thought maybe I, I saw that. I saw <laughs> that. Um, I will actually, I will boost my, uh, my lighting a little bit somewhat too. There we are. Okay. Um, but, um, and it's a little bittersweet because my mom had just passed uh, a couple of weeks before I was in London working with Cleese. And, you know, I, I had this incredible moment. It cracked him up. And there's, there's a great photo of the two of us. Uh, actually, you know what we're laughing at? Oh my God. There was a photo of me showing Cleese a picture on my phone because he was, he's, you know, he's 80 at the time, 83 now, 84 now. And required a little bit of help with his lines. So there were, you know, cards around the set. I don't think, uh, I don't think I'm too out of line. And he had never seen that famous photo of guess who? Robert Duvall with a big cue card around his neck talking to Brando <laughs> on the set of Godfather. Yeah. And I showed him that photo for the first time. And there's an, I'll send you the photo. It's a photo of Cleese and I cracking up at Brando's process. Cleese <laughs> <laughs> uh, said I, I will absolutely say it. Um, it's you know, it's in my favorites. Um, but um, but then I had this kind of weird moment where, like, you know, like okay, we have to turn around, and it's a British crew, so um, uh, uh, you know, we there's a T interval coming up, so you know, you have a, you have a moment, and um, and I just got really, it was it was hard because I wanted so badly to call the woman who took me to see a fish called Wanda, and oh, tell goodness. her like, dude, guess who I just made laugh. Lady, Absolutely. guess who I just made laugh, you know, and Absolutely. you get those moments, you know, and I have a feeling your dad was probably a, a movie and, and TV buff as well. And, yeah. and I, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, they got to see a lot of cool shit. They got to see me do a lot of cool shit. So I can't super complain, but, um, That's yeah, Cleese was, uh, Cleese was fascinating to work with. Okay. Um, these stories are in my book. It's called No Job for a Man. It comes out in November on Pegasus Press and uh, Pegasus Books, rather. And uh, yeah, No Job for a Man is a quote about the acting profession that my father was a little too free with, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> no Job for a Man. That's pretty simply said right there. there yeah. So many ways, so many have dissed the business and that's... <laughs> 
this business of show. Um, and but so it's um, it's not some sort of like you know uh, mommy dearest axe grinding thing, but it is uh, it's you know me finding out if indeed that is true over the course of several years. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, it uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it en it ends in a in a, a really uh, uh, I think it ends in a, a good place. He'd um, uh, would he be thrilled? No, but I think he'd ultimately he is he is vindicated through the through the telling. But yeah, that comes out in November. Uh, I just got I just got the cover. How long was I working on? I was working on it for a while, but I didn't tell anybody because I cannot think of a worse sentence than "Hey man, how's your memoir coming to lawn?" <laughs> I love it. You, wrote, you emailed that to me and there was not a, even the, the slightest part of me that wasn't overjoyed and thrilled instinctively that that's, you know, that you'd be. Doing. Oh, I appreciate that. And again, I'm not kidding. You, you figure prominently. Um, and because it's, it's all nice stuff. I, I didn't feel right. the need to send it to you to, to, um, uh, you know, is there the story about, about the, uh, uh, I was going to make a horribly tasteless joke, but I'm not going to, um, you come out great. <laughs> you come off great. Everyone comes off great, except maybe Jeff Zucker. Um, but that's fine. I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. His, I remember his... freezing. I remember when Zucker came to, uh, to the set for one of our tapings and I had some long monologue where I was, you know, it's long cross-examination and I just couldn't get it. I kept messing the lines up and we had, they had to chop it eventually. And, and I, I remember just thinking, I mean, it's my fault ultimately, but I was like, Zucker is there. This is tensing me up. And, uh... you know, yeah, no, he was a, he was a really weird guy, and he had gone to Harvard with Appel at the same yeah. time. Yeah. So there was a bunch of like extra levels of eh, this is strange. Like they know each other, but they weren't besties. But right. you know, there it's that Crimson Mafia shit that I will. You know, I went to Ithaca. I will never understand that stuff. You know, <laughs> that's. <laughs> You guys do that, um, but it was um, it was that era of him. Uh, well, the other big show that year was Good Morning Miami, which Miami, was right, with his story. Like, basically, it was based yeah. on it was a story of a uh, hotshot young TV executive who right. takes over a morning show, which is what Zucker had done before he took over all of NBC. But I think he was not. He was new to pretty much. Did I just get knocked out? Oh, he was. Pretty uh, much new. He was uh, oh, uh, I didn't know. I just got a, uh, I, I got a weird thing. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what my computer's doing here. Hold on. Right. Sorry. It, it's offering <laughs> me, it's offering me a chance to write something, and I don't wish to. So I want this to go away now. And... Go away. Do we just keep going? We keep can going. Actually... Yeah, I have no sure, idea what's can... going on, but keep going. Why well, wouldn't well, I, I, I? Zucker was was quite new. I think he was newly head of the network at that point. Yes, he had only been for a little bit, um, uh, and. Uh, and we were, you know, one of his his flagships. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that was a fascinating time. It was. I mean, I, I refer to it as grad school because it was all told from my first pre read to cancellation. It was close to sixteen months, and I know that isn't a full program, but everything absolutely went right on that show for me, and then absolutely everything went wrong. And like they would bring in, they would bring in Robert Guillaume to play a judge and I was just starstruck past all words I fucking Benson is the judge and then <laughs> he had had a stroke a couple years beforehand I thought it didn't affect his timing at all but some executive got uncomfortable with it so they recast him oh, that man. felt weird it was just one odd thing after another on that yeah. gig and uh oh wait is it a view thing did someone fuck with view Nope, that isn't it. <laughs> the stupid thing is doing, but just keep talking. It's fine. <laughs> nope, Do you have that any questions, it. Will? I don't understand what my computer is doing. It won't stop. You're fine. We're good. We're making this work. We're making this work just you fine. Are co we are co-editing Will Harris's whiteboard. I'm happy to be doing this. Okay, here. Close whiteboard. Thank oh. God. Okay. Jesus Christ. Okay, Karen. <laughs> Yeah. You were just dissing Jeff Zucker and talking about Rob Guillaume's stroke and you know. <laughs> as the it, was, it was weird. I mean, it was it was a we you know there was there was some funky stuff that went on. I mean, I thought he was great because it was just it was just because he was Robert Guillaume, you know, and he had this the, his timing was still there, mm -hmm. and he just had this incredibly dry quality that was Benson. You know, he was great at that stuff. He could you know absolutely dismantle you with a, a very sly question and it was really fun to watch but um yeah we had some uh oh you remember who was on as a uh as a mafia witness was david proval from mean streets 
who had just been killed off um, of The Sopranos a few months beforehand as Richie April. And I was like, fucking Richie April is here. He's at the table read. <laughs> Richie April is here. And Anna turns to me and goes, I know. And he's, of course, right behind me. He's literally, it was, it, was a, it was a sitcom moment of Richie April being genuinely right behind me. And he goes, careful, he'll hear you. <laughs> I remember thinking, though, I remember thinking I kind of wish we had stayed with uh, with single cameras. I never loved multi-cam. I just, this sort of, I mean, and there's, everybody would say, oh, it's like the theater because, you know, you get to, you get to rehearse, you have a live audience and, there was something about that. I felt like it also generated a lot of nitpicking um, that I felt with single cam was not quite as much. You know, we, you know, through no way. fault, through no fault of the enormity of your performance, we lost a certain amount of subtlety that literally just, it was not, it was not in direction or anything. It was literally in, there are fewer jokes per page because we have to account for the audience's laughter. And we lost a bunch of great runners Um. There was, you remember that gag that they had? They kept trying to bring it back where you would change suits when you were going in uh, to trial. You were like this impeccable dresser, but oh, you would right, change right, right. suits to something like shitty and men's warehousey because right, you didn't right. want juries resenting you. Come, yeah. You were bespoke if you were uh, if you were in the office, but yeah. in front of a jury, you were wearing something that didn't fit right. And it was yeah. this great, like, weird classist thing that your character had going, and they lost yeah. that in the multicam. There was a great gag that we could only do in a single cam where I'm such a nerd for remembering this shit, but it was such a hugely significant job for me, Peter. You don't, this was another gig for you, but this was my, this was my first big break. So there was a gag where um, it's getting super dark in here. I'm going to turn my lights on too. Hang on. How's it going? Well, all right. So there was a gag on the show where, um, Scott Foley's character was supposed to get a translator in to um, to translate for a witness who only spoke Spanish, and he gets left out. He gets left out there high and dry, and he, and he humiliates himself in front of the judge. And then in the next act, we discover that you are fluent in Spanish and could have translated the whole time and just did it to to show off. And you, so you learned all this fucking phonetic Spanish. And rattled it off. And that was the moment where my talent crush was just through the fucking moon for you. <laughs> so I was like, I can tell. Because you were like, I don't know if I want to do this. I didn't take Spanish. This is how I got a whole thing. And um, I was like, I'm sure you'll be okay. And you just rattled off this gorgeous Castilian Spanish. And they subtitled it. which And subtitles don't really work with multicam because they got to yeah. look at the monitor for it. It's a whole, it's only a single cam joke. And it was so good. And that lost. We got rid of that. There was a bunch of weird shit that went by the wayside when we transferred on this show that nobody met. 12 million people watched, but 20 years ago. 12 million is <laughs> stunning to me. I can't believe that. That's crazy. 12 million. I think, I think House was, I mean, House went off the air for a number of reasons, but one of them was that, you know, part of it was, well, it's just not where it was. Right. And, and I think at that point it was like in the, yeah, in the mid-teens yeah. Maybe it was maybe it was in, maybe it was hovering around ten even if you say I mean even that you know it's like in, and that was not you know oh look what's happening I mean, I fascinating believe, twelve million that's just nuts yeah crazy right yeah there you go Will did you have any other questions no I think this has been amazing uh, and it's exactly what I want from these conversations seriously it, it's it's fun to have two actors going back and forth and me chiming in when there's a moment to do so and I really have not needed that many moments. <laughs> Peter, let's. Um, uh, it hasn't been twenty years, but it's been a couple. And uh, exactly. let's not let that. Please look me up next time you're in Los Angeles. I, okay. I, will. I, I know you have a family. lot of very famous, important friends, but if you could find some time when you're not crashing on Tim Blake Nelson's couch, to uh, <laughs> I would consider that a personal favor. <laughs> All right, John, you were. You just are too funny. Have always been the fastest and the sharpest and the wittiest. It's unbelievable. Oh, for sure. All right, love for Jamie. Thank Goodbye. you very Thanks much. Thanks, you guys. I really appreciate it, and I look All forward right. to seeing the episode of you doing the, the podcast together yourselves. Oh, we'll yeah. make it work. We'll make it work. Thank All right, you. see you guys. Bye. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys.